Our Father, how good it is to be in your house again today. Thank you for allowing us to be here. We pray for those who are unable to meet with us today. We ask that you would minister to their hearts. Lord, we pray for those who are in need of a Savior. We ask God that your word would reach out with the gospel and bring them to your, knee, to your, to your cross. Father, we pray that as we look into your word together, that our minds would be open to, to hear and listen to what we need to learn. Father, we ask your forgiveness of our sins. We pray that, O oh God, that we would become more like you as we fellowship together around your word and as we walk with you each day. Father, we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We hope to be sharing with you in the next uh, few weeks from the Epistle to the Galatians. Today's message is entitled, Turning to a Different Gospel. We'll be looking at Galatians chapter 1 this morning. This letter to the church of Galatia was written by the Apostle Paul within 25 years or less from the time that Jesus ministered here on earth. And he wrote it to address the acceptance by many individuals, churches in Galatia, a different gospel, which he says is really no gospel at all. And some were teaching that all Jews and Gentiles had to submit to, the men had to submit to circumcision and to the Mosaic laws, the ceremonies and regulations outlined by Moses in order to be found righteous before God. Essentially, it was a believe in Jesus plus gospel. And this was causing great confusion in the churches of Galatia. And let me stop here for just a moment um, to say that the Apostle Paul, along with Barnabas and some others, established the churches in Galatia. And I say that to remind us, and re remember, besides Jesus, there probably wasn't a more powerful preacher and teacher of the Word of God than the Apostle Paul, especially in the Gentile world. And yet... Here are churches, at least four of them that we know that Paul established. We read about in Acts chapter 13 and 14. And at least four of those in the region known as Galatia. And there were probably more churches that had become established. But there was, despite the fact that they had had a strong beginning despite the fact that they had had a very powerful and persistent minister to guide and direct them and to get them established, they were still now facing confusion. And I bring that up that we might be reminded that it doesn't take a lot of poison to kill the rat. As I've mentioned to you before, if you will look at the ingredients on a box of decon, less than 1% of it is poisonous. The rest of it, if that poison weren't in there, would just help that rat just live a happy life. And so we as a people of God need to be careful when it comes to the doctrines of the Bible. We need to know them and we need to embrace them. And we need to be careful about listening to any other ideology that pertains to the scriptures. Now, it was causing great confusion in the churches. Let's read together from Galatians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, 
sent not for men nor by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers with me, to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not consult with any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none other of the apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God, that what I am writing you is no lie. Later, I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are of Christ. They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they praise God because of me. This, Paul says, what was transpiring in your midst was a faith plus gospel. It promoted a belief in Christ, but it was still binding the people to a works-oriented righteousness. This is what came to be called legalism. Legalism. Legalism establishes requirements of salvation beyond repentance and faith which is the, really the essential requirements of the gospel of Christ. And it adds a rigid moral code. One of the things that the, was happening in Galatia was the credibility of Paul as an apostle was being attacked and challenged. In Acts 13 and 14, Paul and company first missionary journey to the cities of Galatia established these four churches mentioned here. The city in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And the heart of their message is found in chapter 13, verses 38 and 39. Let's share it together. It, it should be on your screen. Therefore, my brothers... I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you through Him. Everyone who believes is justified, that means just as if they had never sinned, from everything you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. As he begins to write to this church, and by the way, Paul wrote a number of letters to churches. But Galatian is the only letter in which he really offers this group of individuals no commendation. Even the, churches, the church at Corinth, 
that was rife with all kinds of problems. He found things to commend in them. But he was so concerned about this departure from the real gospel, the only gospel, that he didn't offer a commendation to this congregation. And notice, he begins, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is the solution for salvation. The law couldn't save. All the law does is point out what is right in the eyes of God and what's wrong with how I'm living. That's all it does. It points, it lets me know that I cannot save myself. I cannot meet God's standard. I cannot. But grace is God's solution for salvation. Grace is unmerited favor. It means God offered me and He offers you and He offers the world His salvation if we will trust Jesus Christ and yield to Him. Peace is the result of salvation. Peace. Not peace with the world, but peace with God. Jesus Christ is our peace. He purchased our peace. We were at war with God when we were lost. We were enemies. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5. And peace is the result of our salvation. We have peace with God. We're no longer considered God's enemies when we trust Christ and receive His forgiveness. We're no longer His enemies. We're at peace with Him. And also being at peace with God, we can be at peace with ourselves. And you know, people who aren't at peace with God and with themselves, they find it difficult to be at peace with other people. Grace and peace. We notice here that Paul doesn't accredit himself or any other individual. He doesn't accredit the church. He doesn't accredit Jewish traditions. He credits God the Father and Jesus Christ as responsible for salvation. Now you say, well, pastor, you're not telling us anything we didn't already know. Well, let me tell you something, folks. The Galatians had already known this too. But they became confused on the issue. That's one of the reasons we need to be reminded what our salvation is all about and where it came from. We need to be reminded. Now God the Father and Son are accredited because they planned our salvation. They planned it. From the creation, before the creation of the world, before the foundation of the world, God planned it. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. That was before sin ever came. That was before humanity was ever created. How did, because God is eternal. He doesn't see and know things and plan things in a linear perspective like you and me and every other fallible being. God knows the beginning from the end. There's nothing, there's no surprises in God. And that just blows my mind because I just can't hardly figure out how that's possible. <laughs> but if we could, then I'd be God. There's things that we can't figure out because it's beyond humanity. It's even beyond the, the understanding completely of the angels in heaven because they don't know everything. Only God does. I'm glad the devil doesn't too, aren't you? But God planned our salvation. And in other words, it wasn't just an afterthought. When, when Adam sinned, God was not surprised. He already had a solution God the Father and the Son are accredited because they provided for our salvation. Did you notice what Paul says? 
Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. They provided our salvation. How did they do that? By way of the cross. Listen. The ministry of Jesus is a wonderful thing and the teachings of Jesus are wonderful gifts. But if it were not for His dying on the cross, they would not be very meaningful to us. All the wonderful things that He did, all the kind thoughts and all of the moral teachings that He gave, if it were not for the cross, it would be meaningless to us because we would not have our salvation paid for. It would not have been, as Jesus cried from the cross, finished. But because of the cross, God provided salvation. You remember how serious it was? Because when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, He cried tears and shed uh, His basically, He was sweat blood. And He said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, Your will be done. And you know what? The cup didn't pass. Why? Because it was something that had to be done or salvation could not have been won for us. They provided our salvation. They proclaim our salvation through the gospel message. Remember when the angels came at Jesus' birth and they sang, Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. The message of the gospel is a good news from God that we can be saved. Let it be proclaimed. When Jesus was about to leave, having died on the cross and been resurrected and had met with His disciples, He said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Proclaim God's salvation. God the Father and the Son are accredited too because they permit or grant us our salvation. Listen, you can go to any church. I don't care what the title is over their door. It could be Christ Chapel or any other title. And you can be baptized every Sunday. And you can take communion every week. And you can do all of those things that the church cannot grant you salvation. God can grant it. God can grant it. And He says, I want to. Because He is unwilling that any should perish and wants everyone to come to repentance. Now the Bible says that everyone doesn't, but that's God's wish. That's God, God wants. That's His desire. These next verses, verses 6 through 10, Paul talks about the gospel and perversion. He's mentioned grace and peace, and now he talks about the gospel and perversion. He mentioned that they're listening to a different gospel, that there's really no gospel at all. In fact, he calls it a cursed perversion. That word anathema, I think, is probably in some of the translations like the King James Version. And what that means is devoted to destruction. Devoted to destruction. This different gospel is really no gospel at all because what it does is it pulls us back into the failures that we should have already recognized. We can't do and be the moral individuals that will perfectly please God the Father. Jesus does that for us. Now, what they were accusing Paul of, not only of being a self-appointed apostle and teacher, but a teacher of 
libertinism. And we've talked about legalism. And legalism is adding something to, and that's what was happening among the Galatians. But what they were accusing Paul of, not the, so much the Galatians, but those who were leading them astray, they were saying, Paul, what he's teaching you is a libertinism. A form that suggested that most moral principles and restraints are unnecessary. It's just the opposite spectrum of legalism. Legalism says I need to do good works in order to be okay with God. But libertinism says that basically you just come and believe in Jesus and then you just go ahead and live your life and don't worry about the things of the flesh. You just live your life. You don't have to think about, you know, being holy or righteous. And that's, uh, that's sort of what they were accusing Paul. But Paul, in his own words, written to the epist in the epistle to Romans chapter 6, Paul asked this. He knew people were saying this, not only in Galatia, but that was being spread abroad even years later. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? For he had already he had written, where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. And so he's, he's knowing that there's going to be some trying to accuse him or of teaching this libertinism. And he says, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Jude, one of Jesus' half-brothers, by the way. You remember um, one was mentioned here, James, who was called the brother of the Lord. But another brother was Jude, as mentioned in the Gospel writings. Jude, verse 4. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. And so on one extreme, the Galatians were experiencing a legalism, faith plus my own works. And that was not a gospel. But... We also see that there were those who were trying to say, oh, faith, and then you can just live any way you want to. You've got your ticket to heaven. And Paul and Jude both say, no, that isn't the case. That's not what the gospel is all about. In fact, didn't Paul say to the Galatians that Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age? Paul wrote in his letter to the church at Philippi, he said this, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Now, I want you to notice this. We're told here to work out what God is working in us. This work out is what it says. It doesn't say work for. It says work out what God is doing in your life. The change that He is making. The Holy Spirit who is developing the character of the Lord Jesus Christ as we obey what we know from the Scriptures we are to do. The last part of this chapter speaks of God and Paul. In verse 11, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Brethren, we need to understand that the gospel that we share together is not something that was thought up 
by humanity. It was something that was revealed to us from God. And Jesus Christ was the greatest revelation of the Lord God in heaven. Paul's previous way of life is described here. He says, my previous way of life in Judaism, you, you've probably heard of it. I intensely persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. Now he's saying, this is what I used to be. This is how I used to be. I was advancing in Judaism beyond most of those my age. I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. In other words, look, these Judaizers are no, nothing compared to what I used to be in the direction they're trying to lead you other than without Jesus, period. But God, when God, who set me apart from birth, literally, that is, set apart from His mother's womb. I want you to think about that just a minute. That means that God already had a plan for Paul, even before he was born. Now I want you to think about that in the context of killing babies in the womb. What if mama said, well, it's my body and I don't want this child. It's my choice. It's my body. Yeah, that baby in your womb is not your body. It's its body. His or her body. Doesn't belong to you. Belongs to God. Every human being, born or preborn, is made in the image of God and it is a sacred, sacred thing. And none of us have the right to take what belongs to God. In the womb. He said, I've been called by grace. We know Paul, think about it. All, all of his learning, his, his previous studies in the Scriptures, oh, that God could use that to help him along the way. But God didn't call him because of what Paul was or what Paul knew. God called him before he, Paul ever developed any of that, those characteristics. Do you know God has a plan for your life? He has a plan. He has a program for you. I don't know what it is. And you don't know the entirety of it. But God knows, and when you begin to implement what you know, God leads you to the next step. But God has a plan for your life and mine. Called by grace. Not called because you have a, a degree behind your name. Not called call because you have any of these things. But called by His grace. In other words, it's an unmerited favor that God calls us to go by. Paul said in verse 16 that God was pleased to reveal His Son. I'm glad He was, aren't you? Pleased to reveal His Son. And I was sent to preach Christ. Sent to preach Christ. And you know, in my life, there's been a noticeable change, Paul says. He says, because they, those people who didn't know me personally, they heard this report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. What a change. What a change from a man standing there holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen to the man who was willing to to face the sword of Nero and stand and testify to paupers and princes of the grace of Jesus Christ. 
What a transformation. A man who lived his life trying to climb the ladder, who lived his life trying to, to step on anything that got in his way, to a man who could write one of the greatest chapters ever written in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 to describe what love really is and to live that kind of life. I want to close with two questions. Are we trying to live by the perverted gospel that is really no gospel at all? Whether it's the perversion of legalism, faith in Jesus plus my moral good works will make me right with God or I hope it will. See, one of the reasons that a person can't have peace, you can't really experience peace if you have a faith plus gospel. You know why? Because you never know if you've ever been good enough. Do you? You never know it till you get to hell and you'll know you failed. But when you trust in the Lord Jesus and lay everything on Him and say, God, how great You are. How thankful I am for Your amazing grace. A grace that is transforming me. A grace that You are working out in my life. You're working in it and I'm working it out. Are you trusting in the finished work of Christ? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit of God to lead you, being instructed by God's Word? Listen, without God's Word, we really don't know how to pray because we don't know what God's will is, do we? The Bible says, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. How can you know and have the light to pray if you don't know what God wants? wants let's pray heavenly father as we bow in your presence dear god i pray that no one here today will misunderstand what's been shared about your gospel let us understand clearly that it is the finished work of jesus christ what he did for us on the cross that paid for our salvation and is the means for our peace with you. But let us also understand that this is not a gospel that brings a license to live just any way we want to live. But it's the freedom and the power by your Holy Spirit to live a life being transformed by you. A life that is dedicated to you. Father, may we never forget this. Now Lord, if there's anyone here who needs to come and bow before you today, whether it's to trust you with their lives, or whether it's to seek guidance and counsel, I pray, Lord, that they might come. In Jesus' name, amen.